Welcome back, everyone. I'm here again with Preston Dennett. Preston, how are you doing? Doing good. Doing good, Sean. How are you? Doing great. So today we're going to talk about or, or review something that is referred to colloquially as the Wilson memo. Now, it's not really a memo in the technical term. It's also referred to as the Eric Davis notes, which is more, I think, appropriate way, a more appropriate way to describe it. So the reason we're talking about this is it was actually entered into the congressional record during the UAP hearings in May. And to give you a sense of that, we're going to a clip to demonstrate that. And then finally, are, are you aware of a document that appeared around uh, 2019, uh, sometimes called the Admiral Wilson Memo or EW Notes Memo? I am, I am, I am not. You're not. Are you trying? I'm not personally aware of that. No. Okay. Uh, this is a document in which, again, I'm not commenting on the veracity. Uh, I was hoping you would help me with that, in which a former uh, head of DIA claims mm -hmm. to have had a conversation with the Dr. Eric Wilson uh, and claims to have uh, sort of been made aware of certain um, contractors or, or DOD programs um, that he tried to get uh, fuller access to and was denied uh, access to. Um, so you're not aware of, uh, of that? I'm not aware, Congressman. Uh, in my 10 seconds remaining, then, I, I guess I just would ask Mr. Chairman unanimous consent to enter that memo into the record. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. Okay, so that is the so-called Wilson memo. So I'm going to pull it up now so that folks can get a chance to, to see exactly what, what they're talking about. Okay, so this is the EWD notes. Now, just a quick background about Eric Davis. So Eric Davis is an astrophysicist. He's currently at Baylor University in Texas. And he spent several years working for NIDS, which is the National Institute of Discovery Science. It is an organization that was put together by Bigelow from Bigelow Aerospace to examine some of this strange UAP phenomena. As an example, it's the, the group that had run a bunch of experiments in Skinwalker Ranch in northeastern Utah prior to the current ownership, which is the group responsible for the History Channel series, The Secret of Skinwalker Ranch. Also, there's a really good book about that particular phenomena called Skinwalkers at the Pentagon that discusses some of the experiments and activity on the ranch during the NIDS timeline because they cooperated with the Defense Intelligence Agency, or at least officials from the Defense Intelligence Agency in, in looking at the ranch. So Eric Davis has ex extensive experience working with government. I think he worked a little bit at Los Alamos National Labs. So he's a physicist and he is, it was, has met with Admiral Wilson. Now, Admiral Wilson, at the time that he met with him, was the deputy director of the Defense Intelligence Agency. And that is the Pentagon's version of the CIA, responsible for all intellig military intelligence, similar to the, like the Russian GRU. And this individual, Admiral Wilson, under his purview would be all these special access programs, which are compartmented intelligence programs where there's a very rigid criteria for need to know. And there's very few people who have access to them, very small groups of people with access to the program or the intelligence associated with it. That said, it was Admiral Wilson's business to know about all these programs, given that he was number two at the DIA. The contention of these notes is that there was a particular special access program to which he was denied access, which is frankly unprecedented. So we're just gonna go through this relatively quickly. Given Preston's 
knowledge of what crash retrievals are, and we'll get into that. I've really mentioned that aspect of these notes. He'll be able to at least add some commentary. I want to also make it very clear to the audience that we do not know the veracity of these documents. So there are a number of different possibilities. One, they could be entirely true. Two, they could be a attempt at disinformation with some elements that are true and some elements that are false. Three, it could be an elaborate hoax by someone outside the system. And then the fourth example could be that it's mostly true, but there are aspects of it where people are reputed to have made assertions and they may have believed those assertions, but those assertions might be completely untrue. And we'll get to that once we go through it, when we go to some of these particular aspects. So this meeting occurred on October 16th, 2002, and Eric Davis is presumed to have written notes. Now I'm not gonna read this out loud. I'm just gonna go down and highlight specific aspects of it. So this is just some of the just meet and greet, small talk that you get into. Right. So there's references to the DIA. There's references to a Boston Globe story by L. Keen about crash retrievals of UFO craft, bodies, et cetera. Yeah, that's Leslie Keen. She's a mainstream journalist who's been working on the subject. So she's quite yeah. well known. Wrote a book Have on it. Have you had any ever had any interaction with her, Preston? No, not directly, but she did write a very well received book talking about major figures high in the military who have seen UFOs. Okay, so throughout EWD is obviously Eric Davis, and then TW is going to be Admiral Wilson. Okay, so there was a discussion about two hours on UFOs, MJ-12. That's the Majestic 12 Committee. Preston, can you just give a brief background on, on what that is. and Yeah, MJ-12 is a group that was formed in 1947 or so following the Roswell crash. Allegedly, this is from the MJ-12 documents, which are quite controversial. Some believe they're true, some not, but this is a group formed of mostly high-level scientists and military officers whose job it is to handle UFO materials UFO crash retrievals, this sort of thing. Okay, so the first thing that they're discussing is a letter that was sent by an individual named Will Miller. So we'll get into that in a second. But this Will Miller sent Eric Davis a letter offering to provide some details on this particular program. And it appears that he's asking about the veracity of this individual by running it through Admiral Wilson. And Admiral Wilson dismisses some of what Miller is asserting and is just making good educated guesses about the extent to which the military is involved in these programs. So this is the letter that they're discussing. And it looks like Will Miller is referring to Eric and then also to Hal. Hal Putoff is a figure who has extensive experience in the remote viewing phenomena and is also a physicist who worked for, I believe, the CIA in doing some of these or on some of these programs. So you know, he's offering to make a meeting with a Bob Beckwith, who has a force model of the universe with planned experiences and levitation, tele teleportation, and time travel. I can't assess the veracity of that, but but if you interestingly though, if you look at Eric Davis's LinkedIn profile, he has a endorsement somewhere from an Andrew Beckwith. I'm assuming that's probably of some relation to Bob Beckwith, but I don't know. All right, I don't have 
That's just a supposition. But again, he's he's offering to assist Eric Davis and, and Hal Putoff in their ongoing research into UFO crash retrievals and entities within the U.S. government that are involved in that business. So there's a few caveats. So, you know, obviously can't mention his name. Well, there goes you that. To, <laughs> yep. Then you have to pay him, right? So each line, each line is like a knock on this guy's credibility, right? You can't say my name. You got to pay me. And then third, I mean, this is more reasonable. He can't provide any. Well, actually, this is kind of interesting. Yeah, so nothing you provide them could can be can it be can have been classified. Which also, you know, this whole this whole program by its very nature is, is something that would be classified. So I'm not sure that by talking about this, he doesn't violate that oath. Okay, so this is what he, he claims to be able to provide. So this is the crash retrievals team. So some of it's relatively standard things. So previously classified projects of the F-117 stealth fighter, other things that the military might have to perform a crash retrieval on might include, but are not limited to like crashed US satellites, crashed Chinese, Russian military satellites, you know, things like that where you can, that have intelligence value to us or to deny intelligence value of our technology to somebody else. And now he's also claiming there's a US alien production vehicle, reproduction vehicle program at Area 51 and associated locations. So this might appear to corroborate some of the stories by Bob Lazar about the government having, I think, the, you know, nine craft in the S4 facility. But again, this, this presupposes that the US not only has recovered alien craft, but has been able to reproduce some aspects of them. And then he's going to was going to provide the name and locate and current location of retired flag rank so that means stars right so rear admiral and above if you're talking the navy and he's talking about a significant ufo event on the east coast of the u.s that he's willing to disclose and then a list of civilian government contractors who work on these projects okay so that was the the reason that eric davis I believe is is meeting with Admiral Wilson. Okay, so again, Admiral Wilson goes to several of these places, so he's been there. This is kind of just when. And then they're just discussing bona fides for Eric Davis. I don't know why there's this no, why he's saying no mention of NIDS. Is, I don't know if that means that Eric Davis is not mentioning it or if there was no questions about it. But obviously Wilson is extremely angry about Miller because he believes he violated his trust and likely his security oath, though he doesn't really say it in so many words. But again, there's this you know linkage to. I, I, I'm I'm guessing this is Stephen Greer, and then this is Leslie Keen for what you were talking about. And the reason that Wilson is upset, or one of the reasons is this story comes out 
in the Boston Globe, and he's going to get phone calls from throughout the naval community um, and the mil- the broader military community in general that has been conditioned to believe this stuff is not possible and only crazy people believe it. So that's what he's talking about with these sarcastic, stupid jokes, stupid comments, comments of surprise and derision that I would be talking to UFO nuts, nutty UFO groups, et cetera. And this is the special executive service. So these are senior Pentagon employees who are obviously civilians. But Admiral Wilson's right, he was taking a risk by talking to this guy. Unless it was accidentally on purpose and this whole document is a, an attempt at mis- disinformation. In which yeah. case, again, this is a highly placed intelligence official in the Defense Intelligence Agency. So everything is a possibility here. And you have to read a lot of this with some skepticism as you go through it. Yeah. Chances are a lot of this, there's probably a lot of truth in this, but there's also potentially several lies to, to confuse the veracity of it and could, could be an attempt at disinformation. I do wonder about that. If Admiral Wilson is so angry, why is he you know, moving forward with this meeting? Well, because the, you know, the, the, the story's out, right? But that's a good point. Like if he's so angry about violating security oaths, why would he be having this ad hoc meeting with Eric Davis? And what does he get out of this, right? What's his motivation? Because he's certainly not getting any money, right? He's certainly not getting any fame. In fact, that's the last thing he likely wants. But I think at the time that this meeting happened, he was already retired. But I'd have to run that. But in order to find out about this information, right, there was apparently an index of all these special access programs. So Bill Perry, as a former Secretary of Defense, <clears throat> I actually met him once because I worked on the Harvard Stanford Preventive Defense Project, which was co-run by him and Dr. Ash Carter, who subsequently became Obama's Secretary of Defense. So Bill Perry is a highly credible individual. And from what this what this is telling me is there was a specific index of these special projects, record group, that had some sort of standard nomenclature. And upon examining this nomenclature, there was a special subset of these like carved out waived programs that did not belong to the usual special access program divisions as organized in 94 by Secretary Perry himself. So in other words, apparently when Bill Perry took over, there were a lot of these random programs that he tried to organize in a way that made sense and and you could make heads or tails of, which I believe was the Special Access Programs Coordination Office. Okay, so this is just, you know, who this Mike Kosternick or Mike Kostinick was in charge of. Or worked in this program. All right, so they find this unusual record group and with no budget info. So, of course, at, at Bill Perry had ordered all these issues to be reorganized and straightened out to improve audit transparency. And Wilson, when asked which, which compartment it is in, Admiral Wilson says it's a core secret. Can't, you know, won't say. Won't say the code name. Won't say the, the contractor, but will admit who runs the program, but will admit 
it's one of the top ones in the United States, which given this was kind of back in 2002, my guess is Lockheed Martin likely, potentially Northrop Grumman, but I don't know. I doubt Raytheon, but it's also possible. All right, so I'm just gonna speed through this. So then he talks to Bill Perry to confirm that he had the right, right contractor and had the right information. So then he's trying, so then he tries to 97 to make calls to the program manager who was in this program. And when he does, they're surprised, right? That they get this inbound call from somebody who's actually supposed to be in the know. So they basically tell him to come in or request that he comes in to speak with them. Presumably from Wilson's perspective to get an informal briefing, particularly because that was his regulatory authority as deputy uh, director of the DIA and assistant uh, joint chiefs of staff J2. So J2 is just, for various organizations in the military, there's uh, J, the designator just means joint, right? So that includes Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, et cetera. And the two is regarding intelligence. So like J1 would be personnel, J2 would be intelligence, J3 would be operations. Yeah, looks like Admiral Wilson's not happy about <laughs> being briefed on all of this. Right. So imagine if <laughs> it, it is your job to control all of these ac special access programs that are legitimately under your umbrella and somebody tells you that, yeah, um, no, it's not in your umbrella, right? Even though they're operating in your department. I mean, of course you'd be upset. So obviously he wants, he wants to be briefed and they kind of blow them off. Well, I shouldn't say blow them off, but they needed to discuss it. And then two days, two days later, they call and they say they want to arrange a face-to-face. -face. Yeah. So he goes, three of them show up. It certainly and, doesn't sound like an oversight, as he put it. Uh, it yeah, it's about the opposite <laughs> of oversight. So they call themselves the watch committee and there's three people, right? You have a security director who's just a retired NSA guy. And here's the other interesting part. It says a CI expert, right? So you know what that means, Preston, right? And if you don't, I'll tell you. No, CI? Counterintelligence. Oh, okay. Which is really interesting. So that's, that's the other interesting thing with all these people who are coming out. Even Lou El Elizondo is a counterintelligence guy. Right. So for the audience, what counterintelligence people do is that they make sure that your spies aren't leaking secrets. So in this whole UFO or UAP disclosure movement, the people coming out and disclosing are these counterintelligence guys, which is rather interesting. <sighs> So one reason your government might do that is if you come out and start revealing secrets or at least appear to be on the surface, you get a lot of people who come out of the woodwork who might actually have real knowledge of some of these programs. And as a counterintelligence specialist, that's a technique for identifying leaks. <laughs> yeah, so... Again, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying that like the like Lou Elizondo and these people are actively work, still actively working for the government to expose the leaks by presenting themselves as whistleblowers when they're actually not. But it is a it is a potential aspect of this world that will that will make your head go crazy. Right. But what anyway, the point is, I find it very interesting that the security director was a counterintelligence expert. 
how is that relevant to like a reverse engineering and crash retrieval program? Do you have any ideas, Preston? Because I certainly haven't been able to figure that out. <laughs> uh, no, other than that, these are the guys who are apparently the ones in control of all of this. And I also find it interesting, one of these guys is a corporate attorney who's, mm -hmm. you know, not military. You know, this is presumably, probably for Lockheed or one of these organizations, but this is a civilian at that high level, has more information about crash retrievals than, uh, you know, Admiral Wilson. That's, I guess, really not surprising because this is something we do see in crash retrieval reports that... Yeah, I mean, actually, say a little bit more about that because we're going to get into crash retrievals in the next episode. Like what you you kind of mentioning offline that there's less military activity in these in these sort of crash retrievals, at least in later crash retrievals. I think in the early ones, there's probably some military involvement or a lot of military involvement, but over time it kind of fades. Is that an accurate statement? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not only just crash retrievals. There are many cases of pilots who've seen UFOs and upon landing are being questioned by people who are not military or intelligence. As far as they can tell, they're civilians who are unidentified. And this is these figures keep turning up in these crash retrieval cases over and over again. The whole military industrial complex we know is who is behind this, but yeah. It's so apparently... why do, in, in your review of the literature, why do pilots bother to talk to these people? Like, look, if I were a pilot and I have some rando show up at my house and wants to discuss something that is highly classified, number one, I have no way of knowing that, at least at the time, because this is during the Cold War, that they aren't KGB. Number two, like I'm not, I'm going to tell somebody who's not associated with the government or who can't show me bona fides to pound sand. But what, like in your examination of the literature, what prompts the pilots who see these sorts of things or not even pilots, but military personnel who are involved or have seen UAPs, what prompts them to talk to these shadowy figures? Yeah, I mean, it's hard for me to speak to that with any real, you know, firsthand knowledge. It's very hard to say other than these witnesses say that they were threatened. So we're basically forced into speaking due to just outright threats to their health and well-being. I don't know. I honestly could not tell you. This is a hall of mirrors. The whole crash retrieval subject is very difficult to investigate because it's heavily compartmentalized. It's, I mean, it's all over the map. Really, mm -hmm. I could not tell you with any real authority the answer to that question. Okay. Well, let's go, let's, let's, let's continue on. Okay, this is kind of interesting. So obviously they're trying to keep this program or set of programs hiding in plain sight. But they were almost outed. And what almost outed them? Well, accountants will be happy to hear. When you follow the money, you can generally begin to expose some of these programs. So someone tried to do an audit and uncovered money that was being funneled into this program and demanded access to it to find out how the money was being spent. So the way that they were able to get access is they just threatened to expose it. Yeah, I know researcher Michael Schratt has done a lot of research into this, showing how much money is truly being funneled into black projects. It's astounding. Most of our defense budget is going towards things that we don't even know about. Well, I mean, as an example, they say that they spent $20 million on the remote viewing program, right? Project Stargate. And I've had a prior interview with Dr. David Morehouse, who participated in, I think when he joined, it was Grill Flame, and then it subsequently became Sunstreak, and then ended at Stargate, because they 
periodically rename these things, right? Because eventually the secret gets out, so they have to relabel it something later on. But in terms of how much it cost, it was reported to cost $20 million, which if you look at government budgets is a drop, you know, just a drop in the bucket and very likely was a multiple of that. It was just they, what they were willing to admit or what wasn't tucked away in some other random budget. Yeah, I mean, what would you even use that money for? <laughs> Seems like there's very little overhead for remote viewing. It's just people. exactly, <laughs> exactly. And in that program, right, you had Stanford Research Institute, SRI, right? That that particular contract alone was probably far in excess of that. So, all right. So anyway, re regardless, this investigator finds the program so they show it to him allegedly and eric davis obviously wants to know if they showed him a craft or hardware and wilson just says well they didn't you know they didn't say anything more than that but what they did is they came up with a formal agreement with the special access program office to prevent this in the future. So they, you know, came up with some sort of special criteria or circumstance and they established criteria and they had a contractor committee to, to look at it. But here's the crazy thing, which is according to this program, no U.S. government personnel are to gain access unless they meet the criteria to be administered by the contractor committee, which included the program director, attorney, Security director. Now, here's that word irregardless, which, you know, let's just say regardless. But that leads to some of the veracity of this document in that somebody with some military experience definitely wrote it because irregardless is a word that I've only heard in the military, right? <laughs> like, so regardless of the tickets and positions US, per, US government personnel possessed. So we, you have this contractor committee that is 100% civilian that has access allegedly to this technology and that decides whether or not U.S. government personnel who have, will have access to it. It's a little disturbing, don't you think? Yeah, yeah. I think this is a big buzz in the whole UFO community and a constitutional crisis to some yeah, extent. Yeah, this is a, literally a corporation <laughs> that can't defend itself, right, in case of an attack or Chinese or Russian military intelligence penetration. Like, So anyway, Wilson asked what the criteria, and, uh, or sorry, Eric Davis asked for the criteria. Wilson mentions that he asked for it, but they, they refused to give him an answer. So of course he's angry because this special access program falls underneath beneath his purview, right? So it's just like, I have three platoons and you can't tell me where the third platoon is? Like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I, it just, it is, it is crazy. And not only that, he walks into this meeting expecting to, to be read in on the program and these guys tell him that wasn't the purpose of the meeting. The purpose of the meeting was to tell him that he's not eligible to be placed on the, to be read in. Right? Yeah. So, which, you know, that they weren't going to let me in the door. Which goes back to the rumors about even presidents not being in the loop about all this. Yeah, so I'm going to say, so... So Wilson says, they said, all my tickets were all confirmed to go down, but I was not on the bigot list. Now I want to stop and explain what that actually <laughs> means because it, I've never, I've certainly never seen that before, but it is something that came out of World War II for, I think, U.S. operations in North Africa. And what bigot is, is to jib, T-O-G-I-B, spelled backwards. And to jib is just a shortening of to Gibraltar because they had to transit through Gibraltar 
to get to it. So anybody who was a very high importance story World War II in the secret operation that you know was on the two Gibraltar list, two Jib and then bigot is two Jib spelled backwards. So for folks who were reading that, that's the parent genesis of that word. Yeah, they're not all caught my not, eye. Yeah. yeah it's not a race it's it's not like a list of like former clan like kkk members in the, <laughs> in the group it's it has like a really weird origin story so what they told him is, is his tickets were loaned not enough he didn't meet the special criteria right so his authorization was, and then of course went back and forth but they wouldn't tell him what that special criteria was. But his argument was that, like, I have statutory and regulatory oversight as the deputy director of the DIA, right? So it was his right to for oversight, audit, justification, like, to make sure that there is an embezzlement, there isn't fraud, there isn't waste, abuse. And they just based flat out told him, sorry, <laughs> you have no authority over us. Even though we're in the DIA working on a special access program that is under, under your authority, at least from a contractual standpoint. So, of course, Eric Davis wants to know who was on it. And, of course, that's, of course, secret. But the scary thing is he's saying most of them were program employees, civilians. He didn't recognize any military personnel. Now, that doesn't mean that there weren't any, right? He just didn't recognize them. And then, of course, Davis wants to know if there's not any politicians. <laughs> and I would say this is actually comforting to me because I'm actually glad these yahoos don't know this information because they would really screw it up. But but at the end of the day, like not even the president, right? Congressional people, I get, right? Because they're just extremely irresponsible and stupid. So I'm not I'm not really too concerned about that. But I think the the way that these insiders see the government see government elected government officials is that they're just passing through, right? They're, they're not there permanently. They're just passing through. And this is a secret, if it is true, that is explosive. And anybody who has access to the secret is an intelligence target by the Chinese or the Russians. So by necessity, if you're in a program like this, you have to, you have to keep it extremely secret, just to protect the people who are working on the project. Otherwise, it could be compromised. So there are some good reasons for this excessive secrecy. But what concerns me, though, is why would you, why would you have these corporate types run it? Maybe they're less likely to be compromised, right, in terms of like a leverage point for people in the military, would be money, right? They don't make a lot of money, even though they have a lot of responsibility. You could solve that problem with corporate types. You just pay them, pay them to, you know, to keep their mouths shut. Although if that's their motivation, there are other leverage points that, you know, you just foreign intelligence services pay them more, just figure out how much they're made, making and pay them more. So well, clearly it wasn't always this way. I mean, Truman was in the know, Eisenhower, Kennedy, clearly found some stuff out. This was the rumors leading to his assassination. Nixon supposedly showed Glass Jackie Gleason bodies at a Homestead Air Force Base. Is that real? Like that seems that seems to me kind of outlandish. Yeah, I don't know. But there's been quite a bit of research on it. And it really comes from Jackie Gleason's ex-wife or who told that story. But there's some researchers who've looked into it and have not been able to debunk it. I don't know. And I know some senators were allegedly in the know to some degree. Senator Bob Dole's reportedly saw, was taken to see a craft at Norton Air Force Base here in California. I know Senator Barry Goldwater of Arizona tried to look into this and was told, no, you do not have the authority. He wanted to see the so-called blue room, which is where a lot of this ET technology is being studied and reverse engineered. And he was told, and where no. is the blue room? Right, Patterson, I think. Um, I'd have to look that up. But I believe that's what I recall. But yeah, and that's was... in Ohio, right? Correct. Yeah, that's where we study all foreign technology, it's UFOs, and anyone in the UFO field knows about Wright Patterson. That is 
where we study all foreign technology, which would, would presumably include extraterrestrial. So the, I'm sure there is some government involvement for them to say, you know, the Bush administration, the rumors are first Bush was part of this. He was the director of the CIA, but I don't know. I don't know. This is not <laughs> my area of expertise. I'm more of a contactee guy. I follow this as best as I can, but man, it is a mess. Yeah. I guess again, I think it's, it's very easy to discredit people by embedding truth in a sea of lies. Right. Again, I'm not saying that's what this document is. It's sufficiently well known enough to be, to have been entered into the congressional record, but Again, if you're in the intelligence and you want to keep this secret hidden, one way that you can do that and stop Congress people from asking these prying questions is you discredit them. And the best way to discredit them is to seed them with misinformation or disinformation and then destroy their credibility by coming out with stuff that is the opposite or makes them look like fools. So you know, I think this is an extremely interesting document. It's obviously written by someone with military experience, or at least with knowledge of what special access programs are, how they work. It has a good understanding and knowledge of how the contracting system works, how the interaction between corporate entities and military intelligence programs work. It has the lingo right. Which leads me to one of two conclusions. One, it's authentic, or two, it's authentic, but it's an attempt at elaborate disinformation, right? And I don't know, there's no way for me to know what that would look like. But anyway, let's let's go a little bit further because there's some there's there's one there's one or two more things. This is when it starts to get to get interesting. So Wilson thinks it's it's a reverse engineering program, but he thinks UFOs are a code for Soviet and Chinese recovered hardware, where they reverse engineer it and things like that. And the people who are in the room, this program manager, security manager, and attorney say, no, oh, no, <laughs> oh, no. They had a craft, an intact craft they believed could fly through space, air, water, possibly dimensions. And Wilson, again, he's grounded. He's a grounded, serious man. And he's just like, okay, well, was it from overseas or not? And of course, they're like, no, you don't get it. <laughs> like, It's not from overseas. It, it's not possible that somebody else on the planet had this technology. So, of course, he asks where, where it came from. And they told him it was not of this earth, not made by man, not by human hands. So the program is you know, not only is kind of this crash retrieval aspect, but they're trying to understand and exploit the technology. And the program was going on for years and years with very slow progress. So part of it, and again, I'm reading into this and these are a bunch of suppositions, but there's a, well, actually this is what they're stating here is there, there's a painful lack of collaboration to get help from the outside community because it's so secretive essentially. So they're isolated, they use their own facilities and cleared personnel and there's only 400 to 800 of these people. Which is not a lot for something this big. That's right. That's right. And, you know, Miller asked questions about kind of Roswell, Holloman, MJ-12. What, what's, what's Zamora and Bentwaters? Yeah. Lonnie Zamora is a police officer who saw a UFO land in Socorro, New Mexico. It's one of the best authenticated UFO landing cases that really caught the attention of the Air Force and the CIA. Bentwaters is the Rendlesham Forest incident in 1981, I believe, where UFOs landed over a period of days at a very large nuclear storage facility. So these are both very, very well-known cases. With a, you know, Well, Bentwaters was very widely viewed. Zamora was just a single witness in this case. So according to J. Allen Hynek, he did a whole bunch of research and found out there were some 400 witnesses to the same type of craft that Zamora had seen in that area at that time. So these are just very well-known 
UFO incidents in the UFO community. Holloman Air and Force the Holloman, Base. Yeah. Yeah. Allegedly, a UFO landed at Holloman Air Force Base. ETs came out and communicated with a military general, I believe, and sort of a diplomatic relationship type of thing. Roswell, of course, everyone knows about Roswell, the 1947 crash in New Mexico. With There's got to be 50 books on that case. Well, yeah. I'm not kidding. And some 300, 400 witnesses. There's no doubt in my mind Roswell is a real incident involving a UFO crash. It's not a mogul balloon. Yeah, these are just very famous UFO incidents. So, you know, of course, this guy Miller, who was with him, that we, I think Will Miller, we talked about earlier, they asked about, he asked about these incidents. They declined to discuss them. Wilson threatened to go to that SAPOC committee to complain, gain access to the program. They're just like, go ahead, knock yourself out. <laughs> <laughs> and then meeting broke up and he went back to Washington. Yeah, Corso. Colonel Philip Corso wrote a book called The Day After Roswell. It's one of few books to reach the New York Times bestseller list. And he's a very highly placed official who talked about crashed UFOs and definitely electrified the whole UFO community. There were some who tried very hard to debunk him unsuccessfully, I think. Uh, and he said a lot of the technology from Roswell was fed to various contractors and things like the integrated circuit, fiber optics, night vision, Kevlar, were all basically reverse engineered from the Roswell crash. Hmm. Yeah, the integrated circuit is definitely something that's not, the digital aspect of it is fairly intuitive, but the understanding of like the way the transistor works is not having studied as an undergraduate it is a very complicated it's just kind of almost counterintuitive it's just very complicated it's, it's it's you know it's not it's not very easy to understand and how they just like kind of came up with it at least the solid state version of it in kind of the late 1950s is is fairly curious right okay Yeah, so they were. So he was basically told, Admiral Willis was basically told that they were keeping this contractor and he was to immediately drop the matter and let it go. So who's they? Let's see. Yeah, so he complained to this committee and the committee told him to drop it. Which implies that, that they, they were. Gonna, yeah, it implies that they knew about it already. So. Yeah, or they were given information that led them to side with the contractor. Right. And it didn't fall within his oversight. <laughs> and, is... you know, like this is very, like for a senior, like a flag officer, this is very consistent with their behavior. Right? Like they're used to getting things done. They're used to having their way. And they get really, really pissed when they don't. When somebody says, yeah, sorry, you're not in charge. You're just in charge of defense. That's all. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Go away. <laughs> that's phantasmagorical um, to me. I mean, I just, uh, that's worrisome. Yeah, so he said nearly got, so Miller and Greer said you nearly got busted. Busted means you lose bank. Right. So I'd have to look at what his rank was. I think he was a rear admiral, which means he'd be a one star, which means if he were busted down, he would drop from a rear admiral to a captain, right? At least a naval captain. So it says told Miller, so senior, so the senior review group chairman, the guy on the SAPAC committee, said if they didn't follow their quote unquote suggestion, that's very mild language for what's actually going on here, that he would not become, he would not be promoted to director of the DIA. So he's being groomed 
to be the director of DIA, which subsequently he he eventually got. He would get early retirement and then lose one or two stars along the way. So, and he's pissed off because he really spent an entire career. You're talking 20 to 30 years, right? 25 to 30 years of dedicated service to the United States military. But they're telling him that they don't, he does not have the relevant regulatory statutory authority over their program, even though that's his job, right? And then he can't even tell you the secret of where the funding com- comes from, right? Whether or not it's, it comes from, you know, comes from him or through him. And these are the people who are involved, corporate types, scientists and technicians, engineers, scientists, managers. Yeah. And then kind of ex- that kind of explains how this subject has been so successfully covered up for so long. Well, maybe not successfully, but <laughs> it's, it's leaking like a sieve right now, or we wouldn't yeah. be talking about it. Which is why people who are officially disclosing all have counterintelligence backgrounds, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, hey, we're we're opening up. You know, we're going to tell you this stuff, and then what it does is it relaxes people with the real secrets, and they come out of the woodwork, and then you get them. I'm not saying that's what's really happening. I'm just saying that's a that is a potential narrative about what's really happening because I just think it's. Very odd that counterintelligence people are the people who are coming out and disclosing information, right? It's kind of curious, right? Yeah, it's very interesting. Well, I, you know, this a lot of this stuff happened quite some time ago, the crash retrievals. And these people are in old age. I mean, I talked to one guy who was literally on his deathbed in the hospital, and he called me, and he was a civilian contractor who worked at Edwards Air Force Base which if you look into Edwards Air Force Base, it's UFO Central. And long story short, he was walking with his employer across the tarmac there by a little warehouse. And uh, looking through the window, he saw a UFO hovering in this hangar. And he turned to his employer and said, what the heck is that? He could hear it humming, was levitating, attached to cables. And his employer turned pale white and says, no, shut up, I'm not discussing that. And wouldn't talk about it for a year until the same employer called the guy I interviewed back for another job. And the guy I interviewed says, I'm not doing it unless you told me what we saw. And what he described was this little tiny craft about the size of a sports car, perfectly silver, shiny, no windows. And his employer said, fine, I'll tell you, but you can't tell anybody. That was not a UFO, but it was reverse engineered using ET technology. So th- these are the kind of stories that there's a lot of out there. And this came from a civilian contractor, not you know, military. But here, here's, here's the thing that I don't understand though. Like if we were able to reverse engineer some of these things, why aren't we using them? To use them would be to let the cat out of the bag and to say that we do actually have this stuff. So I, th- I don't know. I've heard from people that some of the UFOs people are seeing flying around are our own, 10, 20%. I can't verify that. But yeah, that's one of the million dollar questions surrounding this whole subject has definitely it seems like we would be using it. And maybe we are to some extent. But yeah, I think ultimately it's would blow the cover up, blow the lid right off. And that's why it's not more open yeah so i think the last question was yeah he won't he won't answer who's on the list that he recognizes but he talked to somebody named gonsler i don't know who this person is do you have any idea i don't Um, know so this is interesting this is where there might be a deliberate attempt at disinformation or Gonsler is just talking out of his, you know, out of his butt. Yeah, alien abductions and quotes. That's interesting to me. I will say that Stephen Greer, I talked to him about this, does not believe people are, quote, abducted against their will. Having been in this field of research for 35 years, I can tell you for sure 
people are being taken on board craft. I'm not sure I would use the term abduction necessarily, but <laughs> yes, people there are ETs inside these craft. People have met them face to face. They land, they come out. There's no doubt that these abduction reports, such as Betty and Barney Hill, Travis Walton, police officer Herbert Shermer. I mean, I could go on and on about the number of cases like this, the Charles Hickson and Calvin Parker case in Pascagoula, Mississippi, Whitley Strieber, I mean, Betty Andreessen. There's a million people who are having these kinds of experiences. And for them to say just flat out, not real, no, I don't understand that sentence there. How can UFOs be real and contact not be real? Could be just semantics here that we're dealing with, but I don't know. That's a strange sentence. Yeah, so then Eric Davis is asking if they'd be willing to talk to Hal Putoff, which we mentioned at the very beginning, and Kit Green, who's also associated with remote viewing. The interesting, see, that's, uh, this is kind of, oh no, he... So Wilson is familiar with the remote viewing program with Project Stargate, right? But he had not heard the names of those two individuals. Yeah. Well, if someone has not looked into the UFO literature at all, I suppose that's possible. That appears to be the case because, I mean, if he thought UFOs were cover for Chinese and Russian reverse engineering. The whole debunking campaign of UFOs has been very effective, and a lot of people of very high intelligence simply have not looked at the evidence and just assumed that UFO accounts are imaginary, I guess you would put it. So I don't know. I guess I could believe that, but I feel like someone who is you know, that high level of government should have at least looked into the possibility of UFOs being real because so many high-level people have reported seeing them. So regardless, Eric Davis asked if he'd be willing to talk to him to how pulled off and get green. And then Wilson responds with prefers not to talk to anybody else about this again. And then of course, it's like, well, if I do like, what, what are you going to do with this? And Eric Davis is just keeping this for private personal research. <laughs> We'll keep mouth shut, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't, doesn't seem like it, right? <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't know how this leaked, but. Well, he, Eric Davis did give an interview with the New York Times. And you know, the whole, there was a leak in 2020 where Pentagon officials allegedly said we have material from otherworldly vehicles. And that seems to be tracked down to Eric Davis, which is what kind mm -hmm. of exploded all of this into the whole disclosure steps we've seen leading up to this recent congressional hearing that you played a quote of, which where this memo was officially entered into the record. Yeah, so that's, that's all she wrote, folks. I can't say whether or not this is real or a deliberate attempt at disinformation, but it's certainly fascinating. Yeah, it's all the buzz of the UFO community right now because there are various memos like this in you know, throughout UFO history, I guess you would call it. And this is a very recent one. I know Richard Dolan, very prominent researcher, has called this one of the most important leaks in recent times. Wouldn't surprise me if it's real, honestly, because I know there's truth to this subject. I know we are neck deep in this. Yeah watching the whole congressional UFO hearings, I was so excited to, this was unprecedented. This is the first time our government has said, there is something to this. Because with Project Blue Book, they said, nope, shut up. There's nothing to it. There's no threat to national security. If you think you saw a UFO, it was either a hoax, a hallucination, or a misperception, period. And that's what the Condon Committee found. That's what the Robertson panel found. Of course, these were just public UFO study groups. And meanwhile, the many other studies were going on in secret with all the intelligence agencies having their own look into this. So I was really encouraged to see, you know, hear our own government say, UAPs are real. But then they said, we don't know what they are, which really, you don't, I don't believe that for a second. 
And they said, this is our attempt at truth and transparency. And then as the meeting progressed, I honestly laughed out loud at some of these statements they were saying, like Roswell, eh, just stories. Uh, they were asked specifically about the Malmstrom incident, which yep. is of course very well known. 1967, UFOs hovered over Malmstrom Air Force Base and allegedly shut down our nuclear tipped intercontinental ballistic missiles. And they said, no, we didn't, we've not been briefed on that. They said, they were asked, have we ever shot at these craft? And there are many, many famous incidents of, you know, us having shot at UFOs. I'll just name one, the 1942 Battle of Los Angeles, which we shot some 1400 rounds of ammunition at an object hovering for two hours over LA over Culver City, witnessed by thousands of people. There are photographs of it published on the front page of the LA Times. And they said, no, we've never shot at them. I mean, that's a demonstrable lie. So there was just lie after lie through these congressional hearings. So disappointing and hardly truthful or transparent. I can talk for a long time in this congressional hearings. So it's just an hour long. <laughs> And they said, well, you know, we've been studying, we've got, what did they say? Initially 144 cases, and now we've got over 400. But they're ignoring literally more than 50 years of a body of evidence that goes far beyond simple sightings. And if you recall that me meeting, they showed this tiny little balloon-like object zipping by. It took them a good five or 10 minutes to even stop frame the film to show this little white dot. And for them to say, oh, this is the best we've got of a photograph is utterly disingenuous. I don't believe that for a second. Even the green pyramids, they they tried to say that, oh, those are drones. Remember that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Come on, they're not drones. Yeah. <sighs> I don't get I don't know what they easily. are, but they ain't drones. <laughs> they ain't drones, right? I was glad I had nothing next to me to throw at the TV because I was ready to. Man, oh man, that was, I, I would really like to know what this confidential meeting was about, because maybe they were a little bit more serious than that. But that hour long public hearing was truly a joke. My guess is on the con in the confidential or the top or the secret meeting that they had, it was more to assess how do we know that these aren't conclusively these aren't Russian and Chinese capabilities. So what the two intelligence officials would have had to be able to describe is that this is what we know the Russian and Chinese hypersonic programs are capable of doing. We know that they've reached this breakthrough, that breakthrough, but there's no anti-gravitic technology that could explain these sorts of so there's there's some legitimate stuff that they would have disclosed that they couldn't disclose to a modern audience because it would reveal what we know about our peer competitor or peer com competitive technology and, and things like that and what we're aware of. Yeah, and, that's been their yeah. argument for a long time. You know, this is why we can't disclose. It's because it would reveal how we are able to obtain this information. Citizens Against UFO Secrecy there was a very famous lawsuit against the NSA and the judge ruled in the NSA's favor saying, no, we can't reveal this because it would reveal how we are able to obtain this information. And real quick, during the congressional hearings, there was a question about USOs, unidentified submersible objects. And are we aware of this? And they said, that's for the confidential section of this hearing, which I think speaks to you know, how we are able to obtain information about all this and they don't want you know that to be public and, and why do they separately classify them as uh ufos versus U usos it seems to me based on the reports that they're one and the same it's like a transmedium sort of vehicle right or object let's say that's because a vehicle presumes that there's an occupant right i, I, I don't again i don't know there have been reports that there are there have been reports that they're not but if you're just watching these videos you can't you can't tell if there's an occupant they look like they're intelligently controlled 
but are they kind of one and the same? Yeah. Yeah. And I think this just goes to semantics, which has been a complete disaster in this field, calling something a UFO unidentified when they have already identified these, I think, in my opinion, I should say, as extraterrestrial. And then calling them now UAPs, which is no better. It's the exact same sort of wordplay with all of this. I think that they have been calling them, you know, craft for a while. I forget the term they used. They've been called everything from bogeys to unknowns to Foo um, Fighters. Really, they are alien craft, ET craft. That's what UFO has become synonymous for. And USO is, you know, UFO becomes a USO the second it hits the water. They're one and the same. But you can't call it an identified flying object if it's swimming around in our oceans. So it's yeah, it's a complete semantic disaster, this whole field. So why do you think if all this is real, they're obfuscating and hiding the information. You know, is there, I mean, there's plenty of nefarious reasons you can come up with, but there, do you think there's any beneficial reasons, like things, something they're protecting us, knowledge they're protecting us against? Now this is the million dollar question again. Uh, it's very hard to say. The cover up has been the policy pretty much since day one, because I think this did really surprise our government that we're dealing with extraterrestrials that are far in advance of us technologically, certainly. And that was just a natural response. I think we don't know what this is. This could possibly be a military threat. We can't talk about this until we got a better handle on it. And they never were able to fully understand how these things work or where they're coming from. So they've somewhat painted themselves into a corner. But once these things start crashing or being shot down and we're collecting this technology, this is huge. So there's an enormous amount of power given to anyone who has this technology, which apparently is, you know, the corporations more than the military, more than government itself. So this, I think, ultimately comes down to power, money, greed, control. Who's ever got this technology has a huge advantage. I honestly don't know. I think policy would have been much wiser to just bust this wide open and devote all of humanity's resources towards this. But that's not the pathway they took. And I couldn't tell you for sure why this cover up is in place. I think it's sort of just human nature. You know, we see little kids doing this, they'll spill something, and what do they do? They immediately cover it up. So I don't know. I don't know. It's disappointing. I can tell you it's infuriating. Hopefully we'll find out more over the next weeks, months, and years. But it's, it is definitely frustrating because they just yeah. don't have the answers, right? Well, well, here's one guy interviewed Ray Sachs. He was an electrician's mate on the USS Klamagor. This is a submarine that carried nuclear-tipped torpedoes. And back in 1971... He was on watch on the deck of this clam the Klamagor, which was sailing on the surface of the ocean. There was another petty officer and the commander, Boyne, and the second in command. When a USO showed up real quick, it was this glowing object pacing the submarine. Sonar was, had no indication of it on sonar. And this object just paced the submarine for 15 minutes right next to it, which, you know, of course, doesn't happen with any conventional sea-going vehicle. It was far too close, far too dangerous to be another sub, say. And one by one, all the high-ranking officers came up on deck because they wanted to take a look at this. And finally, it darts off. It came in at 100 knots and left at about 80 knots in another direction. And the second-in-command, this is all according to Ray Sachs, the guy I interviewed, turned to Commander Boyne and says, sir, how do you want me to record this in the log? <laughs> and Commander Boyne says, officers who report this sort of incident do not move up in rank. So it was not recorded in the log. And I have to believe that Commander Boyne reported this to his superiors. But this is how effectively incidents like these are covered up. They're just not recorded. All right, well, on that note, thank you very much, Preston.
in the next episode, we're going to go through your extensive experience of crash retrievals. And uh, I'm really looking forward to it. So thank you again. Hey, always a pleasure. Thanks, John. If you enjoyed this video, hit like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.